Welcome everyone. The presentation will begin shortly. This session will be recorded and will last 60 minutes with about 45 minutes of presentation, followed by time for questions and answers. Please keep your microphone muted during the presentation and turn off your cameras. If you have a question or comment, enter it in the chat during the presentation and it will be addressed during the question and answer period. You may also ask questions with video during the question and answer portion. All participants in today's event will have access to the recorded version, which will be available within one week after the live event. My name is Dr. Megan Moran, and I will be the moder moderator for today's presentation. TESOL International Association's Speech, Pronunciation, and Listening Interest section is pleased, pleased to present this webinar titled Listener Factors in Pronunciation Teaching. Our speaker today is Dr. Jennifer Foote, who is an assistant professor at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada. We are very pleased to welcome all of you to this webinar. And now I'll hand it over to our speaker. Thank you, Megan. Um, and I am really happy to be here today. Just let me share my screen with all of you. So um, it looks like we have people from all different places and time zones. So whenever you, uh, whatever time it is there, um, I'm really glad you found time to be here today. So I am going to be talking about listener factors in pronunciation teaching. And I thought I would start um, with this image because we always say um, with communication that communication is a two-way street. And something that I often think about with pronunciation instruction is that um, we often tend to only focus on one side of that street when we're with our learners, which is on their speech and how they sound. And so um, there are a lot of issues that can impact successful communication that go beyond that um, and that are really about um, the person who is receiving the message. And so I think that that is something that's really worth thinking about. Now, um, this information in the next little bit isn't going to be new information to many of you, I don't think. Um, we've come a long way. So I want you to picture 2005. So that was the year YouTube started, which it's hard to believe that it's only been around that long. I was a fresh faced master's student in the TESOL program at the University of Alberta. And that was the year that TESOL Quarterly released a special issue on pronunciation. And this article by John Levis came out, Changing Contexts and Shifting Paradigms in Pronunciation Teaching. Um, and this article had a big impact on me. And it was talking about the shift from a na the nativist principle to the intelligibility principle in pronunciation teaching. Um, often when I talk about them, I talk about them as two opposing concepts. And I decided today that this graphic is more accurate. So the nativist principle was, is, was the older idea with pronunciation instruction that the goal of instruction was to make our speakers sound as much like first language speakers as possible. Um, and so the idea was to try to get rid of a second language accent. Um, but we know from research that, first of all, that it's, it's largely impossible that most, the vast majority of people who learn a second language as an adult will not sound like a first language speaker. And also that it's not necessary and that having an accent does not make a person necessarily make a person difficult to understand. And so what we need to focus on with pronunciation instruction is aspects of a person's speech that make them easy or difficult to understand. So just a couple of quick definitions to make sure we're all on the same page, um, because I, I bandy about the terms comprehensibility and intelligibility. And so in research terms, comprehensibility refers to how easy or difficult an utterance is to understand. So if you listen to it, would you say that it took, it, um, that it was, you had no trouble understanding it or you found it very effortful? And intelligibility is how much of the utterance did you actually understand? Could you have written it down? Um, but when we're talking about the intelligibility approach, where we tend to use intelligibility as an umbrella term that generally means understanding. And so it can include both intelligibility as a research construct and comprehensibility. So with the move to the intelligibility principle, the, the central question that a pronunciation instructor might ask themselves moved from how can I get help my learner get rid of their accent 
to how can I help my, oh, I have listener there. How can I help my learner become more intelligible? So the second question is much better, but it still puts the burden of communication entirely on the speaker. A question that I've seen from many experts, including Levis in that article, is that you can't talk about being comprehensible without asking comprehensible to whom. So researchers have become increasingly interested in listener factors. And I, I put just a few of the articles that have looked at listener factors and pronunciation. There's many more. Um, and they've covered a range of topics, some of which, which are ones I'm going to be talking about today are here. Familiar, the role of familiarity, first language, listener expectations, bias, and there's many more. So one of the big questions is how do you decide if a learner is intelligible? Often when we're in the classroom with learners, the question of intelligible to whom becomes, is the learner intelligible to me? Um, because we can't jump into other people's brains and know if another speaker would find that listener easier or more difficult to understand. So here's a little anecdote break and a little warning because we're going back to 2005 for just a minute. So in 2005, I was doing my master's degree and I was taking a course on teaching pronunciation. In that course, we had a pronunciation tutoring assignment, which was really great for me. Um, and so we were matched with a student and we would meet with the student several times over the term with activities and suggestions. We would record the student when we first met them um, doing a reading task and an extemporaneous task. And in class, we would work together to think about what things we should work on with that learner. And then at the end of the tutoring, um, we would record the student again and we would analyze and submit the recordings and submit a journal of our tutoring sessions and comment on how the student progressed. Now, I was pretty excited because I could tell that the student had progressed a lot over the term and I was really excited to analyze the recordings and I was feeling like I actually was really getting this whole idea of pronunciation teaching. So if there are any guesses to what I found when I did the analysis, well, when I played the recordings side by side, what I found was disappointment. I was surprised that the recordings didn't actually sound very different from each other, certainly nowhere near to the degree that I had expected. So what happened? Well, I think one of the main things that happened was familiarity. Um, and so I put these four areas of familiarity that come from an article way back from 1984 by Gass and Veronis, and there've been many more since then but talking about how um, having familiarity with a specific person, a specific accent, with hearing accents in general, and of course, familiarity with the topic being discussed, which I'm not going to talk about much, um, will all impact how easy you find someone to understand. Um, for familiarity with a specific person, I think most of us can think of situations where this is the case. And um, what I thought of was my my best friend's daughter. And um, she had some speech issues when she was young. And my friend had asked me to listen to her and tell her what I thought, what I thought was she probably should see a speech language pathologist, not an applied linguist, but I did, I did listen to her. And um, I found while we were talking that her mom had to keep jumping in and translating for me. And I often found I couldn't, I didn't know what she was trying to say whereas her mom always did. And I found this often with children's speech. Um, and when we get to know someone, we get to know their speech patterns, what they're going to say. And so familiarity with a specific person um, will make that person easier for us to understand. Also familiarity with accents in general. Um, so the research shows this, and this is a, another thing where I can think of examples. As language instructors, we are often, we're exposed to a lot of different accents and students from a lot of language backgrounds. And we often get very good at, um, at listening to second language speech. Now, this is another example that isn't from a second language. It's um, the movie, Billy Elliot. And I was watching it with a family member and enjoying it. And partway through my family member said, I'm sorry, can we please put on closed captioning? I can't understand what's going on. And I was really surprised because I hadn't found, um, I'd had any trouble at all. 
And it wasn't because I was very familiar with a Northern English accent at that time. It was many years ago. Um, but I had been teaching English for several years and I had had, I had friends from all over the world from traveling. And so for me, I had, I had, um, I just found it easier to understand than my family member did. Um, and we can get familiarity with a particular accent. Um, so I remember having the experience when I was teaching in Japan and we had exchange students visit, that the exchange students during an activity would often have trouble understanding my students. And I was really surprised um, because I thought my students were being very, very clear. Um, and I realized that what it was, was that I had, I had gotten much more used to the features of that accent. Um, and I also did a research project a few years in a window factory. And the reason that they brought researchers in to do this pronunciation project was because everyone in the factory had no trouble understanding each other. They were really good. Um, everyone was used to accommodating and listening to the different um, types of speech that were happening in the factory. But they had some workers who were going to be promoted where they would be doing a lot of work outside the, the company and they were finding they were having difficulty being understood by people who weren't used to that accommodating environment. Um, so um, I would say in, in the earlier research on intelligibility and comprehensibility, the, there was really a focus on first language speakers as the people who would be used in research projects to decide um, how comprehensible people were, how intelligible. But in the last several years, researchers have become more and more interested in second language listeners. And this is really important, especially with English, which is widely spoken as a second language. Um, you're probably fairly familiar with these statistics um, and th they're rough. I, I did a little digging. Every time I talk about the number of English speakers, there's a lot of different figures that get bandied about. Um, and so th these ones, which I just pulled from the internet, estimate that there are about 360 million first language English speakers and about 1.35 billion second language speakers. So that means that most of the English conversations happening in the, in the world are happening between second language speakers of English. And even if you're teaching in a context where English is the dominant language, like for me in Western Canada, that's certainly the case, um, or if you're in the United States, still, we have a lot of second language English speakers uh, living here. And our learners, even here, are going to be having a lot of their interactions with other second language speakers. Um, I put this little graphic in because I just thought when we're dealing with really large numbers, it can be hard to picture just to see the difference in the number of second language to first language speakers and listeners of English. Now, one of the questions that has been really interested is what role does language background play on intelligibility? And there isn't really a clear picture. There's been a lot of research looking at things like the inner language speech intelligibility benefit, which is um, what, what kind of benefit you get if you have the same first language background as the speaker and looking at different, different language backgrounds, rating different language backgrounds. And it seems that there is some kind of effect, but it's not entirely clear. And it probably depends on a range of other factors as well. Um, but some interesting research that comes out of the English as a lingua franca branch of, of, um, of research is that second language speakers might be better interlocutors. So they, they might do a better job at maintaining both sides of the street. Um, often in interactions between two second language speakers, they find that there's, um, the speakers do a better job of accommodating other speakers and better ways of achieving mutual intelligibility. Um, whereas first language speakers often aren't quite as good and sometimes use unsuccessful strategies to achieve mutual intelligibility. First language speakers also often are less aware of the fact that like a local idioms and whatnot might not be understood and finding ways to, to keep their speech within the bounds of what would make um, communication successful. But there have been some studies looking at ways to improve first language speakers attitudes towards listening to second language speech and their ability to comprehend second language speech through exposure or instruction. 
Um, and these studies have generally found that first language listeners can become better at communicating with second language speakers, which I think is really good news. The problem, of course, is that we aren't teaching first language speakers. And so all we can really do within our classroom is help our learners to deal with interactions outside of the classroom. So how can we do this? Well, I have a lot of ideas about this. And so I'm going to focus around a couple of main ones. Um, so one is that I think it's important in pronunciation classes to talk about beliefs and attitudes around accent and intelligibility. Um, so not just talking about these are the things I noticed about your speech that I think might cause an intelligibility issue, let's work on them, but also looking at some of these outside factors. So that can include things like the role of language background, um, issues around bias and listener expectation, which I think sometimes we're hesitant to talk about in the classroom because it's really negative, but it's also a reality. Um, the role of listeners in successful communication and the ownership of English and and the idea that the onus doesn't need to be always completely on the speaker. And it's also good to help learners develop strategies for dealing with interactions outside of the classroom. So in terms of learners' belief around accents, we know from, um, from research, and this goes back to the intelligibility principle, we know that it is not necessary for a learner to sound just like a first language speaker to be successful in communication. We know that accent and comprehensibility and intelligibility are not the same thing. And that, well, if a, um, if a person is rated as being not very comprehensible or not very intelligible, that it's likely they will also have a, a heavy accent, but that the reverse isn't necessarily true. And there are lots of examples I'm sure you can think of, of people who have very noticeable accents, but are very easy to understand. And as I mentioned earlier, it is unlikely that an adult learner of a second language will be able to sound like a first language speaker. Um, however, learners often hope to get rid of their accents. Um, and it's something that I hear time and time again, and, uh, and learners often equate accent reduction with increased intelligibility. And so um, when, I, when I drew those lines about the intelligibility principle and then the nativist principle and showed that intelligibility is becoming increasingly common, I think instructors tend to advocate it. Certainly research is geared in that direction, um, but things don't change overnight. And so often I find my learners often have something of a nativist attitude in their goals. So, when I teach pronunciation for years now, I usually start with these two questions. And so one is, is with good instruction and strong motivation, students can sound like native speakers. And the second one is the stronger your accent is, the more difficult you are to understand. And I have found, I would say almost invariably, that a number of students, not all, but a number of students um, believe these statements to be true. And these statements are entirely centered on the idea of intellig intelligibility being based on the speech itself, along with unrealistic expectations of how easy it is to change. And so um, I, I like to talk to my students about both what's possible with pronunciation instruction. And luckily we do know there is, um, when I first started teaching pronunciation, we didn't really have research from evidence, a lot, very much evidence from research the pronunciation instruction worked because there wasn't a lot of research on pronunciation in general, which fortunately has changed. Now we know that instructed pronunciation does work, um, but there isn't a magic technique that is going to have help students sound like first language speakers, though I've certainly seen products on the internet that advertise that. Um, and so, our learners can't control necessarily who they're talking to and, the, and what's going on in the minds and ears of those listeners. And one of the reasons I think that learners often want to get rid of their accents is because accent discrimination is a real and serious problem. Um, I recently wrote a book chapter, which isn't out yet, on accent discrimination in the workplace. 
And I was surprised how much research I found. Not a lot of it wasn't from applied linguistics, documenting and showing accent discrimination. And so I wanted to share this quote. I found it quite a long time ago, and I often share it because I think it captures really beautifully um, the role that accent plays with our identities and in our lives. And it says, your accent carries the story of who you are, who first held you and talked to you when you were a child, where you have lived, your age, the schools you attended, the languages you know, your ethnicity, whom you admire, your loyalties, your profession, your class position, traces of your life and identity are woven into your pronunciation, your phrasing, your choice of words. Yourself is inseparable from your accent. Someone who tells you they don't like the way you speak is quite likely telling you that they don't like you. Um, as I said, there's a lot of research on bias and on discrimination in regards to accent. Um, I just put a few articles up here. A, a book that I recommend if you're interested in this is English with an Accent, um, the second edition, um, which is available as an, as an ebook. Uh, it's really interesting. And I think it, it's good for us as, as pronunciation instructors um, to know about this and to think about it. I wanted to share this recent piece of research. Well, fairly recent, it's a few years old. Um, about how easily people's perceptions can be affected in terms of comprehensibility and intelligibility. So this, this study was called Social Attitudes and Speech Ratings by um, Reid Trifimovich and O'Brien. And so this research was done in Montreal and they found 60 first language English speaking listeners. And they were from um, a wide range of ages. So they, they wanted to use age as a variable in this study. And they rated 40 um, recordings of Quebec French speakers of English. Now, the, the, the participants were divided into three groups. And so what, they, what happened was when the, when the participants got off the elevator to go do the study, they, were, they went through the study one at a time. They would be met by a research assistant who on the way to do the study, went along with um, one group just got the standard, you know, how are you? How was your trip over? How's the weather doing? Um, and then two other groups got a manipulation. And so one got just a casual anecdote about the, the participant talking about how they had gone to a coffee shop and how the person tried to speak to them in English and how great it was um, that they were making an effort to speak in English and that learning languages is hard. Um, and isn't it great that they put in the effort and they were able to have this successful interaction? And the other heard critical comments also about going to get a coffee, but about how the pronunciation, the person's English was not very good and how they'd had this bad interaction in a coffee shop and that Canada is a bilingual country and people should learn both languages. And so they heard these negative comments about a second language speaker. And then all of them did the ratings. So, what was interesting um, was that compared to the baseline listeners, the positively oriented listeners gave higher ratings of comprehensibility. So after hearing a positive story about a second language speaker doing the best they could, then when they heard speakers, they tended to find them more comprehensible. Interestingly, the behavior diverged under the negative bias condition. Um, so compared to matched baseline listeners, the younger listeners actually upgraded the speakers. So if they heard that negative story, they went in and said, no, these people are really easy to understand. Um, and well, the older listeners downgraded the speakers on all the targeted measures. And the main one that I was interested in there was comprehensibility. Um, and so there seemed to be some kind of generational thing happening. I'm guessing maybe the younger listeners um, found that anecdote to be inappropriate. Um, and that maybe there were different attitudes in the in the older and younger listeners that were either reinforced or that they challenged based on that anecdote. But what I think is interesting about that is how um, how much what's going on in a person's head can influence then actually how easy they find speech to understand. And other research that's somewhat not similar, I guess it's different, but it gets a the similar idea of of our, our beliefs or our thoughts affecting comprehensibility and intelligibility is research on reverse linguistic stereotyping. 
So if you're not familiar with this research, what uh, how it's often done um, is that two groups of listeners will hear the exact same speech. Um, and so the study that I'm most familiar with, they hear both groups will hear a recorded lecture on a topic. And the only difference between the two groups is that one group will be shown a picture of, um, there'll be, both groups will have very similar pictures in terms of things like the clothing that's being worn, whether there are glasses or not, the age, but one group will see someone who is perhaps of Asian background and the other, some uh, they'll be shown a picture of someone who's white. And nothing is different about the speech itself, but they found um, with this research that the people who believe that they might be listening to a second language speaker will actually perform more poorly on, comprehension, on a comprehension test afterwards. Um, and so this shows how I think a thing to take away from this is if a person believes that something might be more difficult to understand, they will actually understand it um, more poorly. And this is also something that is really beyond the control of the learner and has nothing to do with the speech itself. Um, I just want to make, yeah, okay. Um, so one thing that I think is really helpful to do with our students is to find ways to confront the native speaker norm. And so what I mean by that is the idea that the, the best, most effective way of speaking is like a first language speaker and kind of the idea that first language speakers are the owners of English. And so back to that 2005 issue, in the introduction um, to that issue, the editor wrote, sorry, I thought I saw a comment in the chat, but I didn't, um, that pronunciation is perhaps the linguistic feature most open to judgment. As a surface structure phenomena that is most noticeable, one's accent easily evokes people's biases. For the same reason, pronunciation has been the most prescriptively taught aspect of language instruction. Um, so as I said, nobody owns English. And if the numbers were who, what decided on who the winner was, if somebody got to own it, first language speakers certainly wouldn't be the ones who own it because they're definitely in the minority in terms of numbers of speakers. So um, what can this look like in the classroom though? Well, one thing that I think can be helpful and I have done this myself is using second language speech models in class. And so saying that you don't need um, you don't need to be a first language speaker or sound like a first language speaker to be intelligible and comprehensible is somewhat undermined if every, um, every speaker that you use to show your learners how to speak effectively is a first language speaker. And so um, an article that I really like by Murphy from 2014 in System said that the incorporation of at least some attention to non-native speak speech samples would make it possible for course participants to explore some of the ways second language speakers have to foreground the comprehensibility of their speech while continuing to manif manifest qualities of recognizably non-native accented speech. So um, one of the activities that I've done traditionally in pronunciation classes with higher level learners is to have them overdub a TED talk. Um, and this is often for students who are in English for academic purposes and it's to help with presentation skills and to help them focus on pronunciation. Um, and with that assignment, I stress, I, I always stress that they don't need to pick a first language speaker, that they should pick an effective speaker and someone who they think is a good communicator on a topic that they're interested in. Um, and when I first did this, I wasn't sure if anyone would choose second language speech models, but actually a number of students did and did a really good job with their presentations. Um, with the TED Talks, it was especially easy because all, most TED Talk speakers are quite effective communicators. Um, and, so, and so that really helped. But also um, there are a lot of really effective second language speakers. And so bringing those sometimes into our class to use when we're helping learners with pronunciation uh, can be a good thing. It doesn't mean we need to do that exclusively, um, but it's helpful. And it also makes, helps our learners become better listeners to second language speech because our learners aren't only speakers, they're also listeners. Um, 
And I think it's good to talk about learners' beliefs around language background, including other second language speakers. As I said, our learners are also out in the world communicating. And so I just wanted to share with you something interesting that came up in some research that I did a few years ago. And so I was interested in um, what underlies people's judgments of whether someone is rated as highly comprehensive, having high comprehensibility or low comprehensibility. And I had Mandarin listeners, French listeners, and Hindi listeners, 10 of each group, listening to other Mandarin, French, and Hindi speakers and rate them for comprehensibility. And after they did their rating, they would then do a think, um, they would then talk into a microphone explaining their reasons for the rating. And I coded all of those, and there were many, many reasons given. But one of the codes that I used was whether the per they talked about the person's accent specifically um, and where the person was from. And I found that of the, um, I coded them for being positive, negative, or neutral. And there were only two positive comments that mentioned another speaker's first language. Um, so you can see here where a person said, um, it sounds like a Hindu person, very easy to understand. And a Mandarin speaker rating a Hindi speaker said the tone for me is very familiar. There were 37 comments made that indicated that the raters felt like they couldn't understand the speaker because of their language background. So mentioning specifically that it's because this was a, um, a Chinese speaker or a French speaker or a Hindi speaker. Um, and going back to familiarity, because this that study was in Montreal where there are a lot of French speakers, um, it, the, the French speakers were less likely to receive those negative comments because I think, and they tended to be rated um, higher. And I think it's because people were quite familiar with speaking to people with French accents in Montreal. So um, I, th I think it can be good to help learners prepare for and deal with interactions outside of the classroom. Um, a really good article is Lavelle and Levis in 2014, and they proposed a sociolinguistic core for pronunciation teaching. And I don't have time to go into all of it, but the um, it was socially relevant priorities for pronunciation learning. And this is the one that I, I think relates to a lot of what I've been talking about with bias, and it's being realistic about both the stigma of accent and long-term outcomes in pronunciation. Um, so, one of the, the trouble is it's not, it, it can be difficult to know exactly how to do this. Um, so what they said was, well, it is hard to change native speakers views in the short run. Second language users um, can begin to change in attitudes by refusing to accept the injustice of others' assumptions or by using humor to displace the power of stigma. Um, oh, I just saw, Someone said they're not seeing the slides. Can I just, are, I, it's a little late now if, um, <laughs> if nobody is, but can other people see the slides? Okay, okay, good. We're quite close to the end. So it, okay, that's a relief. Um, so I'm sorry for the person who can't, but um, you should be able to see them in the video if you're so inclined. Um, and so, I, I think it can be good to have conversation, have students share their own experiences and expertise in this area. Um, and so one thing that I will sometimes do is ask students to share stories of difficult situations they've had where they felt like there was a communication breakdown and how they dealt with those situations. Um, one of the most successful um, times I had with this was when I was asked at a, at, um, at a university's um, Inter, it was a teaching week for teaching assistants, people, grad students who'd been hired as teaching assistants. And one of the sessions that they offered was called Teaching with an Accent, and they had asked me to run that session. Um, and this was several years ago, and I wasn't sure. Um, I, had, I had some interesting research and that sort of thing, and I talked about some of the things I'm talking about here. Um, one of the big ones being that pronunciation is often used as a scapegoat where people, if, if something is going wrong with a class, um, 
Oh, yeah, someone said, sorry, with the Hindu speaker, that was, um, I think, Okay, yeah, no, that's a really good point. Thank you. Um, that um, in the session, I, I wasn't sure, um, I did point out that often, um, and there's been a study that has shown that often issues where students reported they had trouble understanding the speaker, um, that what was actually going on was often more to do with lesson planning and how they were presenting their slides, PowerPoint slides, and that a lot of the students after doing um, a training course that looked at pronunciation and um, teaching approaches, their pronunciation hadn't changed a lot, but their teaching ratings went up a lot because they were presenting the information more clearly on the slides. Um, so in that session though, I, I threw a lot of it out to the people in the room and I, it was a packed session because there were a lot of international teaching assistants who were nervous about about teaching in a first language at a first at an English speaking university and a lot of them already had some experiences and had really good strategies they developed and ways of um, addressing issues with students and I think that the everyone in the session learned a lot more from each other than they learned from me um, and so often listeners have um, our second language speakers have developed effective ways of speaking. Um, also, um, a lot of the research that I've shared today, I'll give in, in, a, in a shorter, more simplified version, I'll share with my learners. And um, I think it's important that learners understand that, well, sometimes if there's a miscommunication, uh, it is because there's something in their speech that's difficult to understand, but that there are a lot of factors beyond their control that are going on. And so, um, I know just in my life, I've, I've talked to lots of second language speakers that are really worried about their pronunciation or think that every communication breakdown is because they haven't, their pronunciation isn't good enough. When actually, um, to my ears, their, 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 their pronunciation is quite good. And so I think often in those, those situations, what's happening might not necessarily be a major issue with the speaker. Um, so to wrap up, I think I'm just about on the timeline that I was hoping for. Um, the, I, at the start of the talk, I talked about communication being a two-way street. And then I thought maybe it's more accurate to think of it as one of these jumble crosswalks, which we've just introduced in my city in a lot of areas for the first time. And people have very mixed opinions about them with traffic flow. Um, but that really, when it comes to successful communication, we have listeners and speakers with a whole host of different factors that come to play, part of it being the speech itself, which is what we're mostly focused on in pronunciation courses, but a lot of it relating to issues around familiarity, attitudes, biases, what's being talked about, the situation with the learners, and um, the situation with the two speakers, and that I think it's, it's good to deal with that. And so... Um, with that, I'm just going to say thank you. And I have my email address there in case anyone um, wants to email me. I was gonna say, if you'd like my slides, that's okay. But since this will be posted as a video, that's not really necessary. And I will stop sharing my screen there. So thank you, Jen, for a wonderful presentation. Um, and now we have some time for questions. You can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask if you would like, or if you don't feel comfortable, feel free to write them in the chat and I will moderate those. Yeah. Hi, Jennifer. Hi. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for the engaging presentation. I would like to ask you about uh, research gap for in your with your experience is there any research gap between this action topic i'm a tesol student a deep profit student actually tesol in tesol so i would like to know is there any research gap or less research attention oh so are you thinking are you looking for a thesis topic <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> um, i actually i think there's there's lots of gaps in in summer um the interesting thing with pronunciation is, is how much it's exploded in the last few years, but it's still a pretty young field. Um, one area that 
this is a little bit out there, but there has, I mentioned there have been some studies looking at um, working with first language speakers to help them become more confident or better at communicating with second language speakers. And those studies have been quite interesting, but they, there have been very few of them. So that's one. Um, in terms of what aspects, like what listener variables impact comprehensibility and intelligibility, I think there's a lot of room for more research because, um, because it is a very complicated topic. And so there have been studies looking at certain language backgrounds rating other language backgrounds for comprehensibility and taking into account things like higher proficiency speakers and lower proficiency speakers and this language background. Um, but there's still a lot of room in that area. Like I would say people have sort of taken first shots at it. And because it's so complicated and there's so many variables that can interfere, I think there's a lot of room for more work in that area. I would say um, because we still, comprehensibility is really complex. Um, and so looking at, at different factors and, and some research that I, I really enjoy too is looking at what's actually happening live in an interaction between people and how they're adjusting and accommodating to each other. And there's some research in that area, but I think there could be more as well. So I don't know, those are a few ideas off the top of my head. Thank you, thank you so much. Definitely I will send you an email also <laughs> to discuss more. Um, I'm looking there in the chat, I see. It seems like practitioners are moving away from terms like native and non-native speaker. Um, Hi, Jennifer. Uh, yep. This is Noed um, from Mexico. May I ask you a question? Sure. And actually, it's because I'm an English teacher, but um, uh, well, it's a group of English teachers here, but we have an American. And this guy uh, sometimes says that we are not pronouncing the words correctly because, for example, the word pronunciation, he says we have to say something like a pronunciation. So sometimes I'm afraid of not teaching, you know, English properly, you know, because of course, you know, this is not my language. My, my first language is Spanish, but uh, to teach English, sometimes it's like a challenge, you know, to all of us down here. Uh, but we are trying because we are daring to teach a language that is not ours because Spanish is our first language. Okay, so what do you think? You think uh, we as a Spanish speaker, uh, you think we are teaching something properly, you know, or we are trying to make an effort to teach a language that is not ours. So my question is, uh, do you think it's, uh, uh, well, can you understand what I'm saying now so far? I can under. I think I understood 100% of what you're saying. Um, and something, well, and now I'm trying to remember mm -hmm. the name of the year exactly and who the authors were. I think it was, um, Sonsat and Levis, and it came out a few years ago, but they they actually did a study looking at second language speakers teaching pronunciation. Um, and they found, um, because there is this idea that you need to have, um, that first language speakers are the ones who should be teaching pronunciation. And their research found that that wasn't the case. They had They had a highly competent second language speaker and a first language speaker. And there was no difference in the outcomes of the students at the end of the course. So I think if you're teaching pronunciation, you want to have speech that, you want to be an effective communicator in the language yourself and be highly comprehensible. But just like I said, we can use sec, um, second language speech models. Having, um, you don't need to have a first language accent to teach pronunciation effectively. And I know lots of people who don't, who are excellent pronunciation instructors. Um, okay, well, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate for your advice. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Jennifer, it looks like there was a question in the chat a little earlier. So it seems like- Yes, about the L1, L2 speakers. Yep. Perfect. Right? So I, I like the shift from native and non-native speaker to L1 and L2 speakers. Though even that I feel like doesn't capture the complexity because of the way we're raised with languages growing up. Lots of people um, are raised bilingual, but um, I think it is a good shift. I prefer the terms L1 and L2 and I try to use them, though sometimes I forget. 
I don't know if it will go to the mainstream. I like to think that it will over time. Um, but often things that, um, like that's a change that is, even in the, even in the research, it's not a change that has been fully made. It's more of a trend. Um, I like to think that it will trickle out. I, I, I prefer first language and second language speaker. Um, I don't know, it might even be more accurate for a lot of people to say, I'm, well, I'm not even sure. Uh, I know just from, um, I was talking to someone at our conference recently about this, or someone was talking about this, about how we need, when we're doing research, we actually need often better language background questionnaires because um, the complexity of the languages people grow up with often aren't captured with even with first language and second language speakers. Um, and still there is favoritism towards native speakers. Yes, there is. There, there is a big problem often with um, first language speakers being advantaged in overseas teaching situations, especially, um, and sometimes being hired or paid better than people who are actually much more qualified. And I was one of those people when I first started teaching, you know, I really didn't have very good qualifications. I was a first language speaker and I wanted to travel. I was 22. Um, and, and so that's something that I'm hoping will slowly change, but it is a, it is a problem. Um, what, here's another question in the chat. What do you know about efforts advocacy for educating L1 speakers on how to better understand L2 speakers? Oh, that's an excellent question, because I do know of projects that have been done that are usually within a research context and have shown, you know, one of the studies that I talked about was actually at a university, um, and it was um, for social students in social work, and it was helping them um, feel more confident in dealing with um, interactions. I think they, they were dealing with, um, this was a number of years ago and there had been a large influx of Vietnamese refugees and I think it was focused on Vietnamese speech. Um, in terms of schools incorporating it more globally, I don't know of any efforts. And I think it would be, um, I think it would be a really good thing to do and it would be a great thing to advocate for, but there may be initiatives out there, but I don't know of them myself. Um, Jennifer, I just got a question. Um, comprehensibility versus intelligibility. Can you remind us of the definitions again? Oh, sure. Um, and so in what when in, in research often, um, comprehensibility, you could see it as a subjective measure or something that gets at processing effort. So if I were to play a speech sample for you right now, and often in, um, when I'm explaining this to students, I do play speech samples and have them do this, which I just didn't think I had the time to do that today. Um, so comprehensibility would be a, a person's subjective rating of how easy or difficult they found a speech to understand. And so it could be that they're a person's incorrect. You might think, oh, that was really easy to understand. But actually, if you were then asked to write it down, you'd get it wrong. Um, or it could be that you actually could understand the whole message, but it felt like you had to really concentrate and it felt effortful. So, um, so that's comprehensibility. And then intelligibility is, did you actually understand it? And so that one is easier to measure objectively. For example, you could play a speech sample for someone and ask them to transcribe it. And if they're able to write it down and every word is correct, then it would have perfect intelligibility. Um, but it could have perfect intelligibility, but lower comprehensibility, because maybe you were able to write down every word, but it felt like you had to put a lot of effort into understanding it. So, but when we, when we talk about the intelligibility approach, it's using the term intelligibility much more broadly, and it really encompasses both ideas. And it's getting at the idea of teaching pronunciation so that speech is easier to understand, as opposed to the idea that we need to get rid of an accent. Um, and there has been a, a huge amount of research. One area that has really been heavily researched is how accentedness, comprehensibility and intelligibility are related. And that is where we have found a person can have a very noticeable accent, but be very easy to understand. And so um, the strength of an accent does not directly equate to how easy or difficult it is to understand. And you can have a second language accent and be very, very easy to understand.
Okay, any other questions? If there are no other questions, that will conclude our presentation for today. And thank you very, very much. It's my pleasure. Thanks, everyone, for coming.